Welcome to High Gluttony. I'm Gretchen. And I'm Becca. And today we're making injera. Or injera, which we say often. And it's either or. We do this all the time. We apologize. We see lots of different pronunciations for things. So we've, we've got the recipe from an Ethiopian cookbook that I decided to buy because I figured it was high time I learned how to make Ethiopian food in some form. We also will reference uh, on food and cooking some and a little bit of internet research. You'll find the resources on our website, highgluttony.com. And we do discuss my first attempt of injera because the, the recording you get to listen to is from my second attempt, which I learned a lot from the first but I did the very traditional seven day method. And we talk over that in the episode. As Gretchen said, we, she does a full traditional one that takes over a week. We do a sort of a cheat one that takes about 24 hours. And that means basically the first step is really just mixing up your flour and water and letting it sit at room temperature overnight. And then the next day you're adding some baking powder and salt before you cook it. So when you, you cook this, it's a, it's basically a crepe. So it's really helpful to have a non-stick skillet, a larger sized, or you can make baby ones. I suppose that's an option. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> but this was definitely at least a world level two dish. I, I might I might even venture to say world level three, because I think there there's obviously a real trick to making this bread and it probably takes a bit of practice. Especially if you're doing it that traditional way. It is still tricky with our quick method, but the way that Gretchen described the process, it felt like there were many options along the way for really fucking this up. So (laughs) I I did find another article online, although it was written by a white woman, where she talked about, she was talking about where how the fermentation can go off and if you do if it does you have to start over she was very pretentious she grinds her own teff flour thank you very much we talk about how that's practically impossible to do at home (laughs) we'll talk we'll talk about that at the end we'll get into it a little bit more it's definitely there there are some places this can go wrong but if you're making the quick style you're not going to run the risk of having it go off or uh worry about creating a bad product it, it quite as easily. Sitting, something sitting overnight is not going to be as prone to go wrong as something that sits at room temperature for seven days. So, right. But even that being said, the cooking as well for something that looks fairly pancake-like was not as easy as I was hoping for. It was not a pancake. It's not a pancake. <laughs> it was, no, you it's cannot... Actually- yeah, hope to go into this pouring out a pancake and that works. No. It is very tricky. <laughs> very tricky. I was going to say, it's more akin to how my dad used to, have, used to have to make my chocolate chip pancakes as a child. Because you can't just mix it in the batter. This is getting off course. But you basically have to cook it entirely on the one side because as soon as you flip it over, your chocolate starts to melt out. Mm. So no flipping. No flipping in this bread. I didn't know you love chocolate chip pancakes. I love chocolate chip pancakes. I love chocolate chip pancakes. I haven't had them in years, but yeah, I ate them every morning. My dad made them every morning for me for breakfast. Oh my gosh. For I several have- years. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is bringing back so many memories, but uh, sidetrack. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> chocolate chip pancakes. All right. Anyway, let's keep going. So no flipping. No flipping and more holes in in the in your finished product. So not not a lot of special equipment, you just need a, a non-stick pan. So ultimately regardless of what method you use if if it's the 24-hour one or if it's the more traditional one, you do want to end up with a really stretchy kind of springy thin dark pancake like we said with these little small holes all over it called ions, I think. And what (laughs) makes this ultimately really special and unique is the introduction to both or to me of the use of an ingredient called teff flour. And so we do talk about that in this episode, but those are really the things that you're looking for. It is simple and it is complicated. And I had a lot of fun making it. 
So find us on Instagram, find us on Facebook and YouTube and highgluttony.com. All of our handles are high gluttony. So find us there where we're sharing what we're up to. Enjoy in Jera. <laughs> Welcome to section one, everybody. This one, we really spend most of the time talking about the cuisine in Ethiopia and Eritrea, including some of the common dishes and drinks and customs that we learned about, which was really fun. We do try to frame a little bit of the dishes that we're making and learn a little bit about those countries. So we hope you enjoy this section. Today, we are going to virtually travel to Ethiopia and attempt, I will say attempt, to make injera. This will actually be my second attempt, listeners. And I was not thrilled with the first one. So, (laughs) this is Gretchen's second time. This will be my first time. At this point, we have done the first step. We'll talk through this later, but we do have dough batter that's been sitting for 24 hours. And so we're actually going to talk you through a couple of interesting things we've learned about the cuisine in Ethiopia and in Eritrea. Gretchen's going to talk to us about the unique flour called teff that's a part of this recipe. And then Gretchen will also talk us through traditional versus the version that we're making, and then we'll make it. So we just wanted to let you know a little bit about what is going to be happening today. We're not going to be cooking right away. So don't be surprised as you're listening that nothing happens for a little bit. As we are trying to pay our respects to the cultural origins of this dish, and I have much respect for anybody that can make injera properly. It's such a simple recipe. (laughs) It's like, of course, I'll be able to basically do this right on my first try. No, Mm -mm -mm. no. Tef, with this. Tef has a learning curve. I know. I'm super excited to learn more about this flower. Oh, I was like, it's not a flower. It's a grass. (laughs) (laughs) That's not what you meant. (laughs) You meant F L O U R. Flower versus flower. Right. (laughs) So, speaking of flower, though, what are you enjoying while we're cooking Ah. today and chatting today? So, I am enjoying, I had a joint of. Bugger. It's I think it's like pineapple orange is what it's called. Yum. It it is very tasty. Orange pineapple. Sorry, I got it backwards. This <laughs> is from the brand Circles. This is Circle Sativa. They are pre-rolled joints. Since this is something mom and I like to do together, is share a joint. It's really I this these are very nice. Really nice high, kind of light, functionable. Get you a little bit silly, but not too bad. What What are you enjoying today, Becca? Well, yours sounds perfect for high gluttony. Does it have terpene information? No, it oh. does not. Okay. It's just the THC, which is 27.58%. Well, that's fun. Less than 0.02% CBD. So no CBD to balance out our THC in this guy. Mine is called Yeska. Y-E-S-K-A. Yeska. Mm. Yes, and, <laughs> and it has a THC of 23.7. And then luckily it does list out the top terpenes, which are oh, nice. lemonine, caryophylline, and myrcene. And then just a little bit of linalool and pinene. I've been really trying to identify which terpene prefer the most. And I think it's lemonine. Okay. That would make sense. Isn't that what we learned as like one of the most like anti-anxiety and anti- like pain or to support pain? I believe so. I'm going to have to listen to that one again. (laughs) We need to listen to ourselves. (laughs) Listen to two episodes this week, so I'm ahead of the curve. Yeah, that's a lot. (laughs) Neither one of them related to what we're doing right now, which would be really (laughs) helpful. But actually nothing we've done so far applies. This is a, this would be pretty, this is a pretty new thing for us to be doing, uh, working with a gluten, well, gluten-free flour, first of all, Eat, doing anything from Ethiopian cuisine, because I don't know why I had never considered making it at home. I also might be learning why I shouldn't have considered <laughs> making it at home. <laughs> this might be beyond me, which is disappointing since it's <laughs> cuisine I love. Right. I guess I should say, not that I love it, because I don't, I would not say I'm, I'm an aficionado or anything. It's been like 
I've been to like five or six Ethiopian places in my life and only two of them, I think on, I've been there twice. So. Right. <laughs> I'm no but expert. you love what you've had. I love what I had. Yes. It all appeals to me. We'll talk about the cookbook later. Yes. Are you drinking anything in particular? I am having a Sergeant Pepper's old fashioned like we had on our last can of quest. Still have honey left over. What are you what are you drinking today? I'm just doing that pretty simple, just uh, rye and uh, San Pellegrino. Nothing oh, too nice. complicated. Yeah, probably going to do some sparkling water after that. I'm sure that I will have had enough booze by the time I'm done with this. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> so where should we start? Well, I think we should start by telling our gluttoneers that one of the reasons you referenced this, but one of the reasons we wanted to make this is because we had the chance to have injera from an Eritrean restaurant that was located in San Francisco. So we got to go together and enjoy that. That restaurant, I wanted to tell you real quick, was, had been there for 28 years and was yes. owned by that husband and wife, but they retired. So yeah. it wasn't, yeah. Well, it was delicious. It was great because we had the chance to have this together. It was a good challenge for Gretchen to try to make. And we both really enjoyed the experience of the communal eating. Talk about pre-COVID. Yeah. But <laughs> buffets will never be the same to me. It's like, right? I don't think I'll ever be able to go to a buffet again. Right? <laughs> oh, God. I'm, so many people bring it on things. <laughs> I'm from Las Vegas. I grew up on buffets. I am i don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> but the injera is pretty cool though as a one small piece of ethiopian and eritrean cuisine and that's this spongy gluten-free almost sourdoughy kind of bread that we'll be making and then obviously also referencing so it is the national dish for both ethiopia and eritrea and if you're not familiar eritrea it's on the northeast part of africa on the, the Red Sea coast and Ethiopia is just its border, its neighbor to the south. Isn't it sort of the, it's that strip along the top of the, what you would call maybe the Horn of Africa or am I, am I incorrect on that? I think it's right above that. I think you might be thinking of um, Djibouti, which uh, is right on the Horn. Okay. I'm not positive though. So Hang on. I'd want to reference a map before. Hang we on, finish. I'm getting one. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> You're right. I was not. I I was wrong because Somalia is the country that goes around the Horn part. Oh, okay. And then Eritrea is on the. It's all on the Red Sea between D Djibouti and Sudan on either side of it on the coast. Not really important, but now we understand where the uh, the countries are here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a little bit important because. Even Sorry. though it's the national dish for both of those countries, it is eaten in a lot of East Africa. So you will find it in other areas. We're going to talk a little bit about Ethiopian cuisine first and then talk quickly about Eritrean because they're very similar. But because Eritrea does have that coastline, it does incorporate a lot more seafood into its cuisine than Ethiopia does. So that is an important distinction that I'm glad you made. Well, because I was wondering. So I'm, I'm also glad that you looked into that. We are learning all the time, Gretchen. So we'll talk about Ethiopia first, just because that's probably the cuisine people are the most familiar with. We learned Ethiopia is known as the land of bread and honey. Delicious. Its most common dishes are wats or alechas or alekas. I'm not totally positive how to say that. I apologize. But these are basically just stews that are really heavy with a lot of aromatic vegetables. It does use a paste made from really hot dried chilies called berber. And that is a part of a lot of these stews. So often you'll get really spicy dishes in this cuisine. And it can contain beef, goat, lamb, chicken, hard boiled eggs, or sometimes fish. But because Ethiopia is part of the Orthodox church, there are many days where you cannot eat meat. So vegetarian dishes are a strong component of Ethiopian cuisine, including things like legumes or lentils or chickpeas. So that is one of the reasons I love it, because you can definitely find vegetarian options pretty easily. Well, and yeah, it's a big part of the, the cuisine in general. So 
feel like half the the cookbook I have is veggie dishes. I can see that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Lucky for us. So traditional Ethiopian meal is served on a communal platter with sheets of injera on top of the platter. And then that's often covered with these stews, these wats or alechas. And so as Gretchen and I will talk about this a little bit later, but or Gretchen and I, somebody will, but it is referred to often as both a plate and a utensil for that reason. <laughs> right. They serve the food on it and then they <laughs> eat with it. Right. <laughs> so each person will tear off a piece of injera. And in Ethiopia, you they exclusively use their right hand for this. So you pick up bites and then scoop it up, share it if you want to, but most often it just goes right in your mouth like that. So no fork, no spoon, no knife. I love it. No dishes. No uh, one plate meal. Yeah. I guess two plate, but two plate, right. (laughs) (laughs) I like that you say legumes such as lentils or chickpeas appear in many guises. (laughs) Yes, they do. They do. I wanted to also briefly talk about some of the drinks that can accompany a meal that's often served with injera, which is tej, a honey-based wine, or beer will sometimes accompany it, or coffee sweetened with honey. Hmm. Tea is also grown in Ethiopia and is pretty popular, but coffee is a really big part of the culture and cuisine. And the resource I saw said that after every meal, a coffee ceremony is served. I didn't see that anywhere else, but they do have a really interesting process of making coffee in Eritrea. And so I'll talk about that in just a second. That was kind of on like just a quick jump into Ethiopian cuisine. And with that in mind, again, it is very similar to Eritrean. But one of the differences is that stew, which is called a wat or a lecha in Ethiopia, is called a chebi. It's T-S-E-B-H-I, All and right. I know T-S is ch in Greek, but I'm not sure how much this connects here, but it's, the stew is pretty much the same thing, called a different word, and then they also have a paste, but this is called hilbet, and it's made from mostly legumes, lentil and fava, or fava beans. So the stew, very similar, called something different, and In Ethiopia, we had mentioned that paste, the berber, which is what is made to, it's part of what is included in making the stew. Whereas in Ethiopia or in Eritrea, they serve this kind of paste made of legumes on the side and that's called hilbet. So again, it is really similar to Ethiopia, although it does have more seafood just because it's on that coast. Mm -hmm. And The Eritrean dishes are often a little bit lighter because they don't use as much butter. But what's interesting is that they do have Italian influences just because, you know, colonialism. And (laughs) because, you know, colonialism. (laughs) Right. So they you'll see like pasta and frittata and some other kind of Italian dishes peppered throughout menus in Eritrea. There's a test taglatelle in the in my cook, my new Ethiopia cookbook. Now we know how that makes sense. <laughs> Colonialism. That's right. how that makes sense. When in doubt, it's usually. Colonialism. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so a couple of common drinks are something called soa, which is a bitter fermented barley, and then mies, which is a fermented honey drink. I bet that's similar to that tej, which I've heard is like mead. It's sort of that along that line. I guess we have to finally make mead. I mean, we have to, or all three of these, maybe side by side. I don't know that they're going to be that different. (laughs) Okay. Okay. I mean, it's (laughs) fermented honey is fermented honey, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Got it. (laughs) So mead, let's do mead first and then yeah, see what happens. We'll compare. Speaking of bees though, real quick, I saw today that magnolia trees are evolved before bees. And that's why they are propagated by beetles instead of bees. Interesting. I know. Okay. So those two drinks are common. Another kind of beer, another fermented honey drink, very similar. And then I did say that 
their coffee is very important and the way that it's made is very important. And so the information I saw said it requires both skill and patience. You have to roast the beans in a skillet or an oven, pound them down or grind them down with a mortar and pestle, pour that into a pot that is half full of cold water and sometimes ginger root, and then boil that. And then you pour it through a filter and then serve it in small porcelain cups with sugar cubes. So coffee is important. So that's it. That was really the overview, I think, as far as it connects to injera. Injera. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all that lovely background. All right. On to section two, where we have our TEF talk. This is all (laughs) about the TEF. (laughs) <laughs> no TED talk here, only TEF talks. <laughs> only TEF talks. <laughs> so enjoy the section all about TEF. <laughs> yes, yes Kenzie. Kenzie. TEF. Because <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to start talking about TEF because that shit is fucking weird well it's not that weird i'm sorry that's that's not fair it's very normal it's actually sort of miraculous i i didn't realize i needed to know so much about teff because i was like it's just a grain well it is but it isn't as a grain composition of teff which i don't know why this was the most interesting thing to me but it was it's nine percent protein 77 percent carbohydrate 2% oil, and then 10% moisture. And On Food and Cooking classifies it as a minor cereal. And I was like, what, what, how can you, how can you accuse it of being a minor cereal? But as far as like world production goes, it does make sense because it is pretty much exclusively grown in this region of Africa for the most part. It does say Ethiopia specifically. <laughs> it does account for 15% of Ethiopia's total caloric intake as a country. This one food stuff. And I mean, it makes sense if their bread is made out of teff flour. I was mad at on food and cooking for calling it a minor cereal when I was like, this seems kind of like a big deal to me as far as impact in the world. But I guess it really is this corner of the world since it's really not grown many places other than Ethiopia. Uh, now, anything that you call a cereal is in the great grass family. So we, we're going to do a little bit of a rabbit hole here where we're going to go off the, the beaten path for just a second because I was like, this is fucking interesting. <laughs> so this is a cereal that means it comes from a grass. So it's like wheat or oats. They're all cereals. You have other things that are called pseudo cereals. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Her? Which includes and may or may not be limited to. I don't know. This was just what was on, on food and cooking. So there are things called pseudo cereals. And I had not really thought about this because I always assumed that quinoa and amaranth were like basically a grass, but they're, they're not. They're uh, amaranth. I would say it actually grows a bit more like corn where it grows like a big long stalk and then like a floofy head. The, it does is make, that the technical word for it? The floofy, floofy head? Yeah, the floofy yeah, yeah. head. Very technical. You know right. me. I'm all about the technicality. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> so quinoa, amaranth, and buckwheat are all pseudo cereals. They don't actually come from a, a grass. And then even more interesting, which I was also like, er, what? <laughs> Buckwheat is related to rhubarb and sorrel. And then I went, wait, even more. Sorrel, rhubarb are related? <laughs> sorrel, the mushroom? No, you're thinking morel. Oh. <laughs> you, there are wild varieties that you'll probably see places. Um, it has a bit of a sour, lemony flavor to it. So sorrel is connected to rhubarb? Yeah, they're in the same family. Wow. Like, yeah, which makes sense because um, at one point I was like, oh, can I feed this to the rabbit? And it has oxalic. There's a type of acid in it that's toxic to rabbits. Um, oh. So no, unfortunately, they cannot eat this, but I can. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
That's, that's a so pseudo cereal is quinoa, amaranth. What was the last one? Buckwheat. Buckwheat. And then what's the connect? What's the leap from pseudo cereal to that buckwheat sorrel? is related to rhubarb? Oh, and sorrel. So that's yes, that's the rabbit. How we got there? That's the rabbit hole. I see. There's the Venn diagram overlap. <laughs> so. It's the buckwheat. <laughs> And this has been weird side things that Gretchen has noticed and that does not really relate to what we're talking about, but you're going to learn it anyway. <laughs> okay. So teff, teff is a cereal. Teff is a cereal. It comes from a grass. There are 3,000 grains in one gram of teff. Teeny tiny. They are one millimeter across. You can plant such a large amount from a small handful. And it grows fair. It's a grass, so it grows pretty quick. It does come in a variety of shades. So, like, you can have white teff or lighter colored. I think they call it ivory, ivory teff. And it ranges all the way to, like, a dark brown. And the more pigment it has, the more flavorful it is. And they also have, like, a red teff, which I would be interested to try. When I first tried to make the... Um, do a test run of the injera, I used some old teff flour and it was very gross. So I threw it out and was like, okay, I will order more teff flour on the internet. I did not get teff flour. I ordered just the grain. <laughs> <laughs> to which my dad was like, well, maybe you can grind it. And then when he saw how small it is, it was like, Mm-mm-mm. I don't think you can grind that at home. <laughs> no. Then I was stuck with eating teff for breakfast for a while, and I still have some, obviously. Not sure I'm sold on whole grain teff. I love it as a flower, but whole grain teff, it's kind of sandy, like, because it's so small, like, it has, like, a very sandy texture. It's not totally terrible, but it is not my favorite sensation. It's been hard for me to get through. But Are you <laughs> eating it just like oatmeal? Yeah. With like, yeah, with sugar and or honey and milk and stuff. This wouldn't be my number one choice of breakfast cereal. <laughs> the interesting thing about injera bread. Now, the way this came across in On Food Cooking, it made it sound like that teff was the reason these breads stay softer longer than other like wheat bread or oat bread. It doesn't stale the same way. But I have a theory that part of that is because of the absit that they stir into it. Okay. Actually enhances the fact that it'll stay softer. Cause I have a feeling it works like it's a little bit more similar to like a chia seed where it absorbs water that like kind of like that and has like a gelating. Of course, now that I say that I'm like, but that is also how wheat works. So I don't know, like, <laughs> but it feels like it's different to me. There's difference. There's difference in the way it absorbs water. All right, we made it to section three, and we start this one off with Gretchen reading through the Ethiopia recipe, e- Ethiopia book that the recipe comes from, and she does spend some time comparing the quick method we're doing and the traditional method that she did on her own. Yeah, and the, the biggest difference between the traditional method and the 24-hour injera is the creation of the absit, which we will get into in greater detail in this section. So look out for that fun word. It doesn't come up where anywhere else. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Enjoy. Have fun. Yeah. <laughs> so I did traditional injera just because I felt the need to be able to do both. And we're using the recipes from Ethiopia. So it's Ethiopia Recipes and Traditions from the Horn of Africa by, and I did buy a book by somebody that's, whose name I cannot pronounce on purpose because I felt like, well, I did look up his biography as well. So he's from Ethiopia. But I was like, if I can't pronounce their name, more likely they're going to be a much better source on this than somebody whose name I can't pronounce. But I actually don't think this is that hard now that I look at it a little bit harder. Because I think it's actually Johannes Gebreseus. Depends on how many of those E's they actually pronounce. I was like, this is not actually that hard. <laughs> <laughs> Johannes was the name of the owner of Asab, the husband. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, full circle. Full circle. 
And so uh, they have the traditional version and then also this like quick version that we're doing. Yeah, the the one day in in Jera, which so a big part of injera is that it's actually fermented, which I had never quite realized with having it in the restaurants. What the flavor profile really was that I was eating. I was just like, I like this. I like this texture. <laughs> I like this flavor. Like, but I wasn't thinking that hard about like, why do I like this texture or why do I like this flavor? And now that I think about it, I was like, oh yeah, they definitely had a bit of a, a fermented flavor to them. And, and so it's it's akin to making sourdough, everybody. But this year, we're all making injera. <laughs> Fuck sourdough. <laughs> new, yeah, the new sourdough. I don't actually love sourdough. I think I like this one because it's not like a really heavy sourdough flavor. It's just very subtle. But I, so I don't have a lot of experience with sourdough. So okay. essentially you have, you do the same thing as a sourdough starter, but with a teff flour instead of wheat so you get a different flavor just because the teff has more of a, a nutty it's a it's just a more complex flavor than just wheat wheat is got it boring Ugh. these days for sure <laughs> you have access to so many things let's get over ourselves with the wheat right <laughs> so ours is one day but it should be a seven day process so you let the the you develop your very what i akin to your sourdough starter that's your first three days and what goes in that just flour and water uh teff okay. flour and water <laughs> okay bottled water you use bottled water because tap water can vary so much you never know what kind of chemicals are in it if you've got high chlorine content in your tap water it'll fuck with your ability to ferment any kind of bottled water will do I used uh, Aquafina bottled water because that's the one I like the taste of. So you mix two cups of flour into one cup of water and mix it together until there are no more lumps. Then you pour a little bit of water over the top to basically give you a barrier over your starter dough and then let that ferment for three days. After three days, dump off that water, which the first time I made it, you know, I said it had a really funky smell. Turns out that's what the water's for. (laughs) <laughs> the water actually like lifts that smell out of the dough somehow. And when you dump it off, it takes all that bad smell with it. Didn't get that the first time. But <laughs> second time, second time was germ. That's then, so interesting. Sorry, yeah. that the water just absorbs that smell. Yeah, it's really, I was wow. like, really interesting. That was, cool. I was not expecting that, that it just yeah, <laughs> picks it up and takes it away. It's like, oh, okay. Great. Oh, you got that? You got yeah. oh, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then after the three days, you take a, what was that, a cup, a cup of your, what they call the sponge, which is just your ferment, your starter, and then mix that with the rest of your flour, your tough flour and water. And so it'll make kind of a little bit looser dough the second time. Cause the first time when I made it, it was pretty thick. I don't know. How was your dough when you made it it, when you did your teff flour and water mixture yesterday. How was my dough in terms was it of dry or is it, it was oh, very was dry? Because yeah, the fir- like the first step of this was quite dry. The second batter that you make was definitely much more liquidy but still quite dense. And then you let it ferment for four more days. <laughs> wow. So you have like I have another couple cups of the starter in my fridge so I could make more. Of course, I have to buy more teff flour, and teff flour is not cheap, actually. <laughs> so. And it wasn't a big bag. It no, was two, not two or something cups. Yeah, it's not right. not a lot, unfortunately. So after four days, <laughs> this was much more of an ordeal than I thought. I was like, okay, it sits for three days, it sits for four days. And I did read the recipe at one point and have all these steps in my head, but I was like, no, this will be easy because once it sits for four days, then I cook it and da 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 da. No. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. We are not doing this step that I'm about to describe to you, okay? Mm-hmm. There's no absent in this injera recipe. The traditional one includes this absent step. So here, here's what I'm talking about. You use a pan like this. A saucepan. A saucepan. You put one cup of water in here and boil it. Then you take a half a cup of this. Of the starter. Of, of the, the base. Of the base. You add it to the boiling water that you add another half cup of water because it's going to absorb all that water that's in there. And you cook it like a porridge, like oatmeal, until it gel, it gels. 
then you wait for that to cool slightly and you add it back to your bat your fermented base batter then when i say cooking for the second time that's when you're using your this pan when we're doing the final bread gretchen's holding up a 13 inch fry pan yes non-stick fry pan so does that clear up the absent for you a little bit yes okay thank you this is another reason why i think it lasts and it doesn't get stale like other breads do is because you've cooked that water into the taff and then you're mixing that into your dough, that pre-cooked step. So it holds that water a little bit, that gelling a little bit better. And that's what keeps it soft. This is just my theory. I have no, no data <laughs> to actually back that up, but <laughs> it sounds okay. good to me. Last but not least, very important step, letting that sit after you've mixed your absit, your cooked absit into the batter, you have to let it sit for at least two hours. Do not skip this step. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, when I tried to cook it an hour after I'd stirred the absit in, and there are hardly any of the A's, what do they call it? Ions. Ions. The little eyes, the little eyes. pockets Ions. that develop. Yeah. Like any of the air bubbles are really small and just it doesn't look right. But yeah, so you have to let it sit at least for two hours, maybe a little bit more would even behoove the process. And uh, don't expect to get the pouring technique at all on any of your first tries because I did an entire batch and I did not get really the right shape for any of them that I just tried to pour out. I ended up having to swirl it around the pan, which is not traditional, but I don't have the right technique and they weren't thin enough otherwise. So... <laughs> So should we get on to it? I feel like I've kind of covered everything. I'm hoping this will be a little bit easier than the traditional stuff. Definitely a lot <laughs> faster. Doesn't take a whole week. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, real quick, though, would you mind just sharing what the taste difference was between them? Oh, well, th I mean, there wasn't much flavor difference between the two. Since your fermentation is occurring over a week, another two hours is a relatively small amount of time for the fermentation. It has more to do with the, the, the gas development than the flavor part of that. But the texture was definitely different. Whereas you want a little bit larger hole in the pancake because that's the part that gives you your, your nice uh, ability to soak up all those tasty juices and stuff. So Perfect. Thank you. That, that's okay. good to know. So it'll still taste great. Yeah, we'll keep improving the process as, as you make it. So I also think that because it's fermented, the traditional injera does not include salt. I think partially because salt would inhibit some of the fermentation, but also because you've already developed a flavor in the dough, so it doesn't need as much salt. I did end up salting my, my batter some just because I was like, this has no salt. So, <laughs> and, and maybe there's a, a step with salting in, in the recipe, but I missed it. It's entirely possible. <laughs> But it sounds like it wasn't listed in the ingredients. It was not in the so. ingredients. And we know how we, I don't like it when you throw shit in and it isn't in the ingredients. So, yep. Water is still an ingredient. Water is an ingredient. <laughs> Please, for the love of Pete. All right. <laughs> so our dough for this one day injera, they are using a chemical leavening agent. Whereas your traditional injera, you're using fermentation as your leavening because it's producing that carbon dioxide. The one day in Jarrah, we did, uh, basically we let it ferment a little bit overnight, but we're gonna use baking powder in order to get our bubbles. So it'll be nice to compare it to the traditional style for that specifically, but pretty much the same. Also, they did add a little salt. So that's, that's your primary difference there. <laughs> Time and energy and salt. <laughs> Time and energy and salt. And baking powder. <laughs> and baking powder, right. And then how many did you, how many came out of the recipe? So I threw a couple of them away because they were really bad <laughs> and I thought I burnt them and they may not have been burnt because they were a little bitter too. So I, yeah, my, my cooking of these leaves a lot to be desired. I need practice. <laughs> uh, one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six. <laughs> Sorry. I just got to one of the really bad ones. Uh, seven, eight, nine. And I probably threw away another three. So I, ha I got at least 12. Uh, wow. Uh, from uh, cooking it in a 13 inch pan. Okay. Awesome. Quite a few. <laughs> and now we are on to section four, which is where we actually get to the cooking part of this whole situation. <laughs> and we cut out a lot of this because I 
I had to turn on the hood above my stove. So that made a lot of the, the cooking process not fun to listen to. So we did spend more time cooking than is reflected on this. But, <laughs> <laughs> but one thing we both did was we both ended up adding a little bit of extra water to ours and thinning out our batter a little bit. We did find Gretchen kicked it off and was started cooking hers first. So she obviously troubleshoots all these things before I need to. But she discovered that it was running a little too thick. So she suggested adding more water. We both did that and that helped a lot. Mm. So we did probably spend at least another half hour talking through cooking all of our injera. Oh my God, I forgot the word. <laughs> <laughs> only said it like 15 times because the, the cooking technique is a, a, similar to a pancake, but not as easy because if you're doing it the right way, you're supposed to pour it in a circle going one way, depending on your hand or your handedness, I guess. <laughs> And then wait till it changes a bit of color and then cover it and cook it the rest of the way. And that pouring in the concent, you know, concentric circles going in, I think especially because you're starting from the outside going in, is not something we're used to. And it was interesting for me to have it cook part way, cover it, finish it, and then be like, okay, I guess it's done. <laughs> like, yeah. It's pretty quick, but <laughs> like. I can't see what's happening. I think it's done. <laughs> yeah. Having a glass lid was beneficial. I, my, my pan had a glass lid. So if you have a glass lid, it's a good thing. But then pretty much once we've both made enough that are the right consistency and color, we call it a day. That was, <laughs> that was, that was our it. injera adventure. <laughs> well, en enjoy the uh, mixing and cooking. Our ingredients for one day in Jera are two cups of teff flour, two cups of bottled water, one fourth teaspoon salt, and one half teaspoon baking powder and vegetable oil. If we're using it, we got to list it. How do you measure ha half a tablespoon? It's one and a half teaspoon. Okay. Yeah, I, it's like, I'd almost rather you write it that way. Me too. Have, like either that or you need to have a half tablespoon measure. Right. But then I was realizing that's not really a thing. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was like, well, I'll just wait and ask Gretchen because I don't, I filled up half a tablespoon and then I was like, well, this doesn't feel very specific. <laughs> so. Any particular type of salt here? Required? No. Yeah. Whatever you like. Okay. And I think I'm ready to go. So I have a, a very large cooling rack. Book recommends putting them on to parchment paper plate lined with parchment paper. But since we don't, we're not worried about keeping this warm, I'm putting it on a rack so that it'll cool a little bit faster because it says you should, gotta, you got to wait for them to cool down before you can put another on top. So you're supposed to stack them. So putting it on a rack is going to allow for faster cooling, whereas the plate will ro rotate a little bit of heat and that heat will then create steam and make some of your, make things soggy. We don't like soggy. Remember, no soggy bottoms. I just turned oh. <laughs> around and my batter looks kind of interesting. What's going on? The baking soda is reacting to the water. The baking powder? I'm sorry, yes, baking powder. So there's like Wait. a big thing of foam on top. So did you, you already added yours? I did. I put it in and now I'm, I'm stirring my, my batter. Oh, would you mind giving us an overview first? No, I don't want to do that. Come on, don't make me do that. <laughs> So 24 hour, 24 hours before you want to eat your, have your, your injera, you need to mix two cups of teff flour and two cups of bottled water together. You want to start with your teff flour in the bowl and add your water to that. Then cover with a dish towel and let sit for 24 hours. And then right before you get started with your cooking, you're going to add that quarter teaspoon of salt and a half a tablespoon or 1.5 teaspoons of baking powder into your dough. So I had left my baking powder sitting on top because I was like, oh, I'll take a picture and then I don't want to mix it together until I'm on video. And it started reacting. And so I then just had to mix it in because otherwise it would... <laughs> I'll go away and we would have no baking powder uh, reaction. So <laughs> had to had to mix it in. Got to save my bubbles. 
Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I'm sorry. So you add your salt and baking powder next? Correct. Before before we cook it. Very important. Otherwise, we'll, you will have no I, I, Ayers? Ayers? Ion? A- Ion? Pretty sure Ion? that's not right either. It's something like that. <laughs> Ion. You are the closest. Ion. Ion. Well, so Gretchen's doing a 13-inch nonstick pan. I'm doing a 12-inch nonstick pan. What temperature is this supposed to cook at? Me- medium high heat on my my most high powered burner over here. It has power boil high and then eight, six, four, and two. I am on the eight. What do you usually boil water at? Power boil. If, what if you're not using power boil? <laughs> the highest setting. So if you're okay. you're I, I think most dials go, you know, maybe five to one or ten to one. I don't know. What does your dial do? Mine goes low three, five, seven high, but I <laughs> boil at five. Really? I most oh. often use three for sauteing. Sort of related, but not related. Speaking to sustainability stuff, apparently electric is what we're all going to need to get used to using in the future. So I'm going to have to get off my I use gas high horse over here and get on the electric stuff in the future because better for the environment. (laughs) I know it's a bummer and it is challenging sometimes. You have to get used to it, but I think I'm going to put mine at just above three. I think that sounds logical if that, if you okay. boil it five, <laughs> what do you get with high or high? I, so there's a power boil setting on one of these. And the first night we were here, I was like, Oh, pfft, I'm going to test this out. And I walk away and I come back and the water is like exploding over the side <laughs> and it like scarred the surface. I like scar the surface all the time, not on purpose, but anytime any liquid boils over, we have to do this whole thing of like putting baking soda down and letting it sit for a couple of hours and then scrubbing it all out. So it's like a really a pain in the ass. And I think maybe like it's kind of a shitty oven, (laughs) but I don't think that's common, but it is a real annoying thing, which is why I'm super careful about not going too high. Mm. And then it takes forever to, to cool get it down. to cool that yeah so it's electric yeah it, right. it, it, okay high medium high heat medium high heat so you're going with the three because you have a crazy oven <laughs> i'm going with an eight on my gas uh range here and i'm starting to get some nice I, mine feels pretty warm okay so you need a paper uh, towel and some oil i have not mixed mine just yet can you give me just one quick second absolutely not i'm actually only going to do half so I can put it in measuring cup and then put the stuff in there, right? Yes. Oh, it's weird. <laughs> Did you separate that or no? No. It's like moosey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Good. Okay, I good. Probably, probably did not give mine enough time. That's that's definitely the texture I found with the traditional Jera. I mixed my water and flour, my Teff flour and water together like, like at like eight last night so or <laughs> got it six, seven I don't know in the evening so it hasn't really been a full 24 hours but it is almost five o'clock now so so almost <laughs> close enough I need to remeasure my stuff I wasn't really thinking about the fact I only wanted to do half it's okay to let it sit for another 24 hours right or so yeah okay. you'll find out I guess I'll <laughs> find out yeah just the longer you let it sit, the more sour it's going to be. Okay, interesting. All right, I'm going to turn my heat down because my pan is real hot right now. I think my, I can smell mine. I might turn it down too. I, because I imagine if I add the oil right now, I imagine it'll start like popping. Should I, it shouldn't be that hot, right? So you're just going to wipe the pan with the, a light layer of oil. I see. Okay. That's why you need the paper towel and oil. And I need okay, the avocado think- oil. I don't think you got to that part yet. Yeah. So I just mixed up my baking powder and salt into the mixture. Okay. And so my pan is heating. We'll see how hot your pan is. You're allowed. You're allowed. You're allowed to do this. (laughs) Uh, It says wipe, wipe the surface, then place hand pan over medium high heat. So you can oil it at any time. Okay. But you just wipe it down. It's not like, okay. Not a puddle. You don't want a puddle. (laughs) Okay. All right. We're lightly greased. Is your pan hot or no? Yes. So then how are we adding it? 
So I tried using a spouted measuring cup, like it said. So I, but I was not having a tremendous amount of success. So I made made mine in my spouted Pyrex measuring cup. This is a four cup size. Fits pretty well. I guess I will try pouring it. Although it does does recommend kind of going a cup or a half a cup at a time. I was finding last night that I had about a half a. I was using about half a cup. Okay. I wasn't having a ton of success with the measuring cup though, so I'm gonna try it today with a ladle, just because okay. I want to see how that works. If that does not work, I will go back to pouring it. So this is an eight ounce ladle that I have here. Fill so one, that's half. one cup. Yeah, one cup. I'm gonna fill it half full, and I've already the pan is already greased, and it's supposed to go from the outside in. All right, I need to w- add some water to my dough. Because this is, oh, okay, that's, that's what's happening. This is what it looks like. Uh, Can you describe is, it? <laughs> I was hoping you might help. Uh, yes. Let's say you're looking at a topographical map. Yeah. And you just want to see rivers. <laughs> and so everything else pulls out and you just have a interesting little pathway of rivers in a circle. This is a real delicate balance. It. Because you're cooking something so thin, it's really interesting because the description of the cooking is like once the color of the surface of the injera has changed, that's when you put the cover on. So mine is hitting that point right now. So darkening a little? Yeah, it's darkening a little bit. Okay. Okay. And how long will you cook it now with the, uh, with the lid on? The book says about a minute and a minute and a half. And so you're just cooking it. You want the bread to start pulling away from the sides so yeah once you can lift it out of the pan real like it moves around in the pan or you can lift it real easily then Mm -hmm. you're good so okay and you don't flip it over you only cook it on one side oh okay all right i'm doing my first one all right go for it counterclockwise count uh no clockwise 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 shit this is the wrong way well down now you can try it both ways maybe you're better maybe you're not traditional or something maybe The edges are already cooking. Yep. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. How long do you cook it before you put the lid on? Until it starts, like 75% of the surface is changed color is what it says. Oh, okay. Thank you. It's at about uh, 45 seconds to a minute and a half. So you're probably getting close if you're not ready already there. I think so. I'm going to put the lid on. Your lid is glass. So you can see what's happening. That's nice. Sort of. Kind (laughs) of. It's steamy. Steamy. Well, it all came out in one piece, but the bottom feels has a little Ooh. crisp to it, and the so- the top is still just really, really spongy. I think that's fine. Okay. Because if the bottom is crispy, then it slides out right out of the pan, right? Yeah. I think you're good. Okay. I'm tasting mine. All right. Let me know what you think. It's good. I don't know why. It has a very fatty taste to me, like almost like a, a bacon or something. What have you been cooking in your pan over there? Nothing. Is that weird? Well, I'm not, I don't really know how to answer that. <laughs> so how many did you get total? I will have five. Okay. Uh, not counting the river map one. Uh, right. Okay. <laughs> oh, this one might not count either. Uh, <laughs> nope. This one's not count either. All right. <laughs> oh, so four. I got four. I could have gotten five had I not fucked up the first one and the last one. <laughs> Four is pretty good. I got two out of my first half. There's a little bit left. Yeah. I think it said it was supposed to make like four. Okay. Two large or three to four medium injera. A standard 11-inch okay. crepe pan is ideal for preparing this recipe. There we go. So injera, everybody. We did it. Enjoy injera. Okay, everybody, last final thoughts here. I thought once again that this was a tricky and easy, complicated and simple recipe because there were so many moments where it could have gone wrong. It was super smooth for me this time, but it feels like it could have gone the way of pasta, the way of my first (laughs) choquette mix like it easily could have gone off and I really wouldn't have known how to get it back on track but this time it all worked out so 
this is one of those rare times when just going along makes everything actually happen the way it's supposed to. But it was really good. I don't know why it ended up tasting a little bit like animal fat. I act, I have no idea. I haven't ever cooked meat on that pan. I can't figure it out. But I did make chana masala to go with it. That was delicious because I love just using bread, non often this time in Jera and just scooping it all up and never once using a spoon or a fork or anything. So this was a win for me. I'll definitely, I would love to make it again. And I don't know if I will. So, <laughs> well, I say actually, I, <laughs> because mostly because I feel like I really preferred the texture of the bread made in the traditional manner where the absit added that nice kind of, it was definitely much closer to the consistency of what I've had before in restaurants where it was really springy and lovely and, you know, just a texture that's divine anyway. And unique. And it's unique. So I really liked it. I was mad that I found out later that most of the, the injera I've probably had had wheat flour in it, which makes it easier to work with. So it's like, aha, <laughs> ha, this is my Right. Yeah. Also, those people have lots and lots of practice make it all the time. <laughs> right. Where a couple things happening there. <laughs> so I I would love to try to make it again, maybe in a slightly different style or using a different flour mix or, you know, I think I'd always have to use the teff. I really like the flavor of the teff. And I made, laughing at myself because I'm so fucking extra sometimes. I did a leg of lamb because we actually made these the day before Easter. So I had a leg of lamb and in my Ethiopia cookbook, there was this celebration leg of lamb that you cut the meat into these long strips that you dip into a really, I mean, this is so good and it really wasn't that hard, but you take this, you cut these long strips. It's just just these like little thin pieces of lamb And you dip them into this flavorful broth that you make with wine, with wine. They wanted the honey wine, but I don't have any of that. We got, we got to make our, we got to make our mead. Mead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you cut, leave one of the, the lower bone in the leg. So it has a handle and then you dip it into this broth, (laughs) bring it out hold it over a platter and somebody cuts the meat off with scissors. And then you take, you dip the lamb in again and cut, cut, cut and dip and cut, cut, cut. And the flavor of this dish was so good. Like I, my mind was blown. It was. (laughs) (laughs) So it was definitely more work that I really needed to do, but it was so fun. And, easy and I love leg of lamb that's like barely cooked so like I mean you're like dipping it into hot liquid and I was you know I like rare lambs <laughs> it's been there for like two minutes great get it out <laughs> get it out too almost too long almost too- <laughs> <laughs> so I don't I don't know because the injera itself is, a, is such a process and, but it was so good. It was so good. I, I think I have to, I mean, I, and I want to try, I just have to try it again. I, I really crave that bread and I want, I want to get closer and, you know, maybe yeah. someday we'll uh, interview Johannes of the uh, cookbook and uh, get some tips and tricks yes. or something. That would be super fun. We'll just casually reach out and I'm positive he'll say yes right away. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) If anyone knows him. (laughs) Yeah, give us a shout. But uh, yeah. It was great. Yeah, I, I, it is one of those things where I'm like, I'm conflicted on whether or not I will make it again because it's kind of a pain in the ass, but also I felt like kind of worth it. So toss up. (laughs) Yep, toss up. (laughs) 
Yep. Actually, no, I'm sorry. I lied. I have actually already made injera again using the base <laughs> from the first time I made it. I mean, it was kind of in the same week, so it really wasn't like weeks later. Mm -hmm. But I did let it sit for a full two hours. I will definitely be making a lot more stuff out of my cookbook from Ethiopia. Injera is to be seen. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm out of water. I guess that means it's time to be done. I think so. <laughs> I can't talk anymore. <laughs> I had I had more final thoughts, I think, but that's probably enough thoughts for since I just went off about the food and how good it was for like a solid five minutes, I feel like. So I feel like that's where we should end it. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> this was fun. Injera. Yeah. I feel a little more worldly today for having right. made this. Yes. <laughs> and a lot more humbled. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's like sometimes the simplest recipes make the hardest shit. So yeah. Show cats. Yes. <laughs> that, no, that, that recipe looks harder than, than this recipe looks to be fair. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Glut mirrors. Thank you for joining us once again, find us on all the places except Instagram. for twitter yeah, yeah. <laughs> we might we and, oh maybe a tiktok we might get a tiktok i don't know um, anyway maybe we should do tiktok yeah and uh highgluttony.com though as always where we share yes. lots of fun things and thoughts on our on the recipes injera <laughs> <laughs> have fun oh bye. no not have fun yeah yeah bye <laughs>